This is your first Sunday with us. We've been working through a series called Rain. And it's very evident that within our world over this past weekend, uh, kings and queens and princes and princesses and dukes and duchesses were on our minds. Anyone uh, up at 4 a.m. to watch the carriage ride? Come on, be honest. Yeah, well, one of you, okay, a couple of you, that's great. So I happened to wake up, happened to wake up, actually Susan really wanted to, so so we saw the whole thing, and I was just there to support her, and it was real nice, but uh, all that to say, we've been working through a series here at West Village called Rain, and we've been looking at uh, the historical account within the nation of Israel, where God made them into a nation. And for years, God, with judges and prophets, ruled his people. And then there was a point in their history where the people insisted, the people demanded that they have a king. And so the first king of Israel was a man by the name of Saul. And for many weeks, we tracked through the story of Saul, his ups, his downs, his obedience, his disobedience, until God finally said, I'm removing the throne from you, Saul, because of your disobedience. We were then introduced to a young shepherd boy by the name of David, who the prophet Samuel then anointed, that is, set apart and said, you now will be king. But even though David was anointed king and set apart to be king, he was just a young boy at that time. And Saul was still on the throne. And so for the past number of weeks, we've been following David on this journey, actually in the wilderness. The current king, King Saul, is, is not happy with David, and he's been pursuing David and wanting to kill David, and David's even had opportunities to seek revenge and has, has waited. And so we're, we're kind of in this point of the historical story where David is on the run, and he's encountering Saul at various times, along with a number of other things going on in his life. And now today, we come again to uh, David, and he's still out in the wilderness, and he's about to have another encounter with King Saul. But even more so, we want to look at kind of what's going on inside of David at this point, for he's been on the run for many, many uh, years now. Been kind of running and hiding and fighting for his life for many, many years. And we're going to see today a David who's growing a little bit weary. A David who actually chooses and makes some very poor choices today. And I think there's some things we can learn from him. If I could illustrate maybe the, the best way I could illustrate what's going on inside of David, I could not help but think of a dog we once owned. This dog's name was Tucker, and he was an English Springer Spaniel. We had him when we lived down in Pennsylvania. Now, Tucker was a highly, highly energetic dog. And I'm going to say maybe not the brightest, and I'll just leave it at that. But we had, where we lived in Pennsylvania, we, we lived in a, in a neighborhood, but behind our house, we had a huge, huge cornfield. And most of the time when we let Tucker out into the yard, uh, he, he stayed and he played and he, he knew his boundaries. We'd kind of set that up. But, but every once in a while, Tucker would run to the edge of the cornfield. And this one particular day, it was, I, I can remember it because it was a spring day. It had been quite wet, quite, quite muddy, probably early summer. And, and the corn was, was starting to come up, but, but we had come home from a long day of, of church. It was a Sunday, and it was time to stay. We got home, was still uh, dressed up a bit, and we, we let Tucker out the back door. And that dog, for some reason, just went running right to the edge of the cornfield. And so, so like a good owner, you, you, you yell at him, right? And I'm sure I yelled good things, but anyways, you yell at a dog, right? And it's like, just, just, just stop. And at that point, right, the dog's sitting right there at the edge of the cornfield, and I'm at the house, and you take a step towards him, and you're like, Tucker, come. You know, you clap your hand a bit, and the dog kind of looks at you, and then the dog looks at the cornfield, and then it's a Tucker, come. And the dog looks at you, and then the dog was gone into the cornfield. <laughs> now, in all my wisdom, I decided, well, I've got to chase him because it's a huge cornfield. The kids 
loved him. And so I get a couple steps into the cord field. It's muddy. And at that point, it was, I'll, I'll be honest, at that point, it was like, I hope you get lost. And I hope you never come home because this is just ridiculous. Anyway, an hour later, the end of the story finishes well. And you know, about an hour later, he comes trudging home in solid mud and everything else. The point in all that is we, at times, can be like a tucker where we come to a point in life where we're standing kind of right on the edge of, of a decision. And it's a decision that God is saying, mm, probably not the best one for you to step into that. And out of one ear we hear God saying, it would be best if you don't step into that. But the carnal, unspiritual side of us is raging inside, and it's saying, mm, no, maybe you should step into that. And what we see in David's life today is God saying, don't step into that. We see this battle raging inside of David, and David, in essence, chooses to tune out God's voice and step into the cornfield, so to speak. And we might be real quick to accuse David of just being unwise or, or foolish, but as we unpack it a little bit this morning, I think a lot of what we see going on inside of David is very common to all of us. And it's unfortunate because by the end of the account, we actually find David living with the enemy, experiencing some rather severe consequence that we'll even see in weeks to come because of a choice not to listen to God and run into the cornfield, so to speak. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to open up God's word together again. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you still speak into our lives today. I pray that all of us would have hearts and ears and minds that are attuned, that are listening to what it is you want to say to us. Lord, our desire is to walk in your way, in your truth. And so help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a proverb that says this. Proverbs 14, 12, within the message, it reads this way. There's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Let me read that again. There's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Take your Bibles. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 26 and 27 today. And for the sake of time, I just want to move through chapter 26 very quickly, tell you a little bit of the story, because chapter 26 actually reflects a, a lot of similarity to chapter 24, which Jeff unpacked a few weeks ago for us. So I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but I do want to just highlight a few things to help us understand the context of what is going on in David's life. Because there was a way that looked harmless enough for David... And yet he didn't look again, and it ended up leading him down a very poor path. Now, as we come to chapter 26, let me just tell the story a little bit. You can follow along through, through the text. But in verses 1 through 3, there's a group called the Ziphites. And they tell Saul once again where David is hiding. Remember, David is in the wilderness at this point. David has about 600, 600 men with their families now with him, and so a little hard to, to hide completely. And this group, once again, comes to King Saul, who's been pursuing David, and says, we know where David is. And with those words, Saul then grabs 3,000 of his soldiers, and they head out again into the wilderness, kind of the southern part of, of Judah now, to hunt down David again. Now, in verses 4 through 5, we see that David learns of this. He sends out spies, and he finds the place where Saul's army has camped. Because you have to remember, right? There's Saul, 3,000 men, plus all the supplies, all that goes into it. And so it's a large group, and they would move for a few days, and then they would set up camp and maybe send out some, some parties to investigate, to explore. And so David now catches word of Saul and his army. They are encamped. And the encouragement now towards David is, we can get him. 
and, and some within David's ranks, they're, they're, they're kind of a, at this point, they're not really an official formed army. They're, they're mercenaries in many respects. Those who have maybe fled from the army, from the military, they're, they're mercenaries that have gathered with David. They hear that Saul and his army are encamped, and David's spies come back and tell them, not only in camp, but it's night. Saul and his men are sleeping. David, I think we have opportunity to go and get rid of the king so that then you can become king. And if you recall, we've seen this scenario before in this account back in chapter 24 where David and his men find Saul in a cave and there's opportunity there for David to kill the current king. And so by the time we come to verses 6 through 12, there's an ambitious soldier. And this ambitious soldier says, I'll go with you, David. And so David and Abibashar, they, they head down into the camp, and we learn a little later on in the account that the Lord had caused a deep sleep to fall upon Saul and all his army. And David and this young, ambitious soldier, they get right up to where King Saul is sleeping. And sleeping next to King Saul is Abner, the commander of the army. And next to Saul is his spear. And this young, ambitious soldier leans in next to David and says, let me take the spear and run it through Saul. Now, I do want to, at this point, let's just take our Bibles and look at verses 9, 9 through 12. I want to read that for us because we see here now David's response. But David said, 1 Samuel 26, verse 9, but David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's, that is Yahweh's, anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, as Yahweh lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head, and they went away. And no man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. And so here we see again David's response, similar to chapter 24. Similar to even what we saw last week when Abigail spoke into David's life, saying, Look, the Lord is at work. Yahweh is at work. His divine activity is at work. David, you've been anointed king, and there is a time when you will rise and ascend to the throne. Let's wait on God's timing. David has heard that message over and over again. David himself, here again, affirms that message, that he would not kill the current king who had been anointed and set apart by God at one point, he would leave the current king to the Lord, and he would leave his ascent to the throne and the timing of that to the Lord. It's also a picture of how Saul's power has now left him. The fact that Saul was surrounded by an army of 3,000, had the commander sleeping right next to him, it shows, and if we were to read on through chapter 26, David yells down and he, he mocks them and mocks the commander of the army. It's this picture that Saul has lost all power, that it is Yahweh, it is the Lord who is in control. And David, even in verses 9 and in verses 13 through 16, as he's mocking Saul, as he's mocking, mocking Abner, it's just this, this picture of, yes, I am trusting God. I am following the Lord. And Saul, your power has been stripped from you. Proven in the fact that the Lord caused you and your whole army to sleep so deeply that we were able to creep right up to your head, take the spear, take your water jug, and by God's grace did we spare you as we trust in Yahweh's plan. And so at this point, we see David living out his faith in a very real, very powerful way. 
These are the moments when we look at David and we go, yeah, I want to be like David. I want to have that kind of trust. I want to have that type of restraint. I want to have that type of confidence in God and his plan for my life and, and, and a nation and my family and my word. But it's interesting. I want you to take your Bibles again, but let's look at verses 17 through 20. Because we also catch a glimpse into what's going on inside of David's heart. We see that David is getting a little weary, a little disheartened with all this running. Look with me at verses 17 through 20. David's yelling down from a mountainside. He's mocking Saul and, and Abner, and he says here in verse 17 of chapter 26, Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, this is David now, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. And so as David now engages Saul, we begin to see that David is growing a little weary. He's growing a little tired. He's growing a little disheartened as would any of us. Think about living out in the wilderness, being pursued by someone who wants to kill you. David is growing very disheartened. And he asks Saul, why? Why do you pursue me? Is it, is it your men? Is it someone speaking in your life saying, get rid of that David? Is it the Lord? What, what, what is it? Who is it, Saul? And David says something now very Key says, I, I don't even feel like I share in the heritage of the Lord. He doesn't even feel like that which he has been promised will come true. He says, I'm not even able to live in the presence of the Lord. And he's referring here, scholars believe he's referring here to the idea of, of being able to worship at the tabernacle, being able to offer sacrifices, participate in the, the, the festivals of, of Israel that, that kept them communing and, and in connection with God. David says, my whole life right now is just, is just I'm a runaway fugitive. I'm a fugitive on the run. And David is growing weary. Feels like he has no, no access to God. No ability to participate in the religions and rituals that connected people back then with God. The feasts, the sacrifices, the cleansings. All David's like, I'm just in a forced exile at this point. Why, Saul? Why? And in a moment, as we come to chapter 27, we're going to begin to see that David in his weariness, David feeling disheartened at this time, even though he continues to experience the powerful presence of God, even though he's restrained himself and God has restrained him, we begin to catch a glimpse as to what's going on inside of David's mind, his, his heart, and kind of what can happen in our lives when we do hit these places of weariness, these places where we're disheartened with life, even disheartened and a bit disillusioned with God. Now, I will say in verses 21 through 25, Saul and David, they have a bit more of a conversation. Saul acknowledges that he has, has sinned. He promises to do David no harm. David really doesn't believe him, states that he'd acted honorably again by sparing Saul's life. David then asks in verse 24 if the Lord would just deliver him out of all this tribulation. And so we see that again, right? We see where David's at. He's like, God, Saul's apologizing. He's confessing his sin. Saul even says, I'm going to go my way. David, you go your way. And David is still just pleading before the Lord, would you deliver me out of this tribulation? This is that in verse 24. 
And we can all, I, I, I would wager a guess, if you have lived life long enough, we've all been there. Where we have these moments and we say, God, would you just make this stop? I'm not sure. You ever, I'm not sure how much more I can take. I wish it would just go away. I mean, have you ever uttered words like that? Thought, thoughts like that? It's the human condition. If I could summarize chapter 26, I would do it this way. Like David, we have moments of great confidence, right? Great confidence in the power of God. And yet in those moments where we have confidence in the power of God, in those moments maybe where we've experienced God in a very real and powerful way, at the same time, isn't it amazing? We can still feel somewhat disheartened, confused, worried with life. And we kind of live with this, this duplicity even at times, don't we, of, of I'm experiencing God and, and I'm sensing his presence and I've, I've experienced his power. And yet with the pressures of life, I'm feeling really disheartened at the moment. But I think what we're going to see and what we can learn is that we must then be aware of how our feelings can interfere with the truth of what God is actually saying and is speaking and has spoken into our lives. Take your Bibles again, and then let's just jump into chapter 27. And look at verse 1 with me. I want to actually unpack verse 1 for a little while here this morning. We read this. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. Now at this point, we should be going, what? What, David? God has spared you for years now in the wilderness. God has proven himself over and over again to you in the wilderness. And the best you can come up with, David, is I'm going to go live with our mortal enemy. At this point, we should be going, how, how does David get to a place like this? What, what is it that's driving David to say, yeah, I know God has spared me. I know Saul has gone his way and I've gone my way but I'm probably just going to die, and so I might as well go live with our mortal enemy. And that verse should just jump off the page, and you should be going, what? What is going on, David? Well, let's unpack it a little bit, because it just shows again where we can all get to as, as human beings. The first thing we see is that David said in his heart. Verse 1 starts with that, that phrase. Then David said in his heart, Scholars uh, agree it's this idea of David's now talking to himself. It's that, it's that conversation that happens between the ears. You know what I'm talking about, right? That conversation that no one else hears, but the conversation we have multiple times a day where we talk to ourselves. And we're trying to convince ourselves of something, make a decision about something. It's these internal conversations that take place within all of us. And the key is, is that when we're having those conversations, it is of the utmost importance that we're having the right kind and we're hearing the right things. And at this point in David's life, it seems as though he's just possessing this pure humanistic thought process. This process where it doesn't seem to involve God anymore, and he's only listening to his own sinful self. Let me, let me just show you an example of how these conversations can happen in our life. You can keep your hand there in 1 Samuel, but I'd like to take you to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, go to the Gospel of Luke. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament, and look at chapter 12 with me. Look at chapter 12. Here, Jesus, the Son of God, has come into human history. He has a lot of people following him at this point in time, and he's been telling and teaching a lot of account and, and story, and he does through, through telling parables. And at this point, someone is, is asking Jesus a question, and Jesus tells a story about a rich person. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 16 with me. And it shows you these are the kind of conversations we have inside of ourselves. And he, verse 16 of Luke chapter 12, and he, that is Jesus, told them a parable, a story, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And here's the key phrase, and he thought to himself. And so this is the internal conversation happening now within this rich man. He says, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will, and notice I'm putting intentionally the emphasis on I will. I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is this the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not the rich towards God. So it's a wonderful example of the conversations we have within ourselves. And I think we can learn a lot from this story that Jesus tells us. He says there's this rich man. And he thought to himself, and we got to guard against that, don't we? When we're confronted with realities, decisions in life, the minute we tune out God, the minute we stop listening to, hearing the voice of God, and we just start talking to ourselves, the challenge becomes a lot like this rich man, where soon the language becomes, I will, I will do this, I will do that, I will listen to this, it is mine, mine, my, my, I will. It all becomes what you say to yourself, decisions that benefit yourself. You make decisions not listening to God at all. And all God has to say about that in this account is fool. You fool. And it goes back to even what we started with. There is a way that seems right to us as human beings. But the warning of the scripture is look again. Look again. It's very interesting that during this period of time in David's life, and we will see as it unpacks, it ends up being about a 16-month period. And in this period of time, and even within chapter 7, 27 of 1 Samuel, we see no mention of God. It is a chapter where all of a sudden, the Lord, Yahweh, not even mentioned. It is a period in time in David's life where we believe there were no psalms, no songs attributed to David. It seems to be a time where David has just now brought himself to the place where he's full of weariness, he is disheartened, and you can kind of just picture him sitting in the wilderness talking to himself. And the conversation isn't going well. So if I could give just a few cautions today, here would be a caution to us. And that is this. The way that seems right to me is often rooted in humanistic thought processes that exclude God and his truth. Let me say that again. The way that seems right to me is often rooted in humanistic thought processes. That is, we take God out of the equation. We take his truth out of the equation. And when we do that, it can become very, very dangerous. 
You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must engage. When we choose to follow Jesus, we must engage early on in the process, the transformative process of having our minds renewed. Listen to what Romans 12, 2 says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Listen, if we are to discern the heart of God, the will of God for our lives and in our decision-making, we must be a people, we must be followers of Jesus that have engaged our minds in a transformative process. We need a renewal from the carnal, unspiritual side of us, and we need to allow the Holy Spirit and the truth of God to teach us how to think God's way. And when we choose to ignore that, we can fall into the same trap of David. We can fall into the same trap as that rich fool we see told in the story of Luke 12, where soon it becomes all about what we think. Well, let's carry on with our story. Then David said in his heart, back to 1 Samuel 27, verse 1, then David said into his heart, he's got all this talk going on between the ears. And then he goes on to say, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. And again, at this point, we should be going, what? David, how long have you experienced God's divine protection? David, how long has God delivered you? How many times has God delivered you? Even you, David, had a chance twice to kill Saul, and you choose not to. Why? Because you're trusting God for his timing. And yet at this point, David's now at a point going, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to die. That word perish carries with it the idea of swept away. It's the idea of, of getting a mound of debris together. It would be like us in the fall getting a, all our leaves together in a pile and then getting your blower and then just blowing them away. And David's like, my life is just this heap of debris, this heap of waste, and it's really just coming to a place where it's just going to be swept away, blown away. I mean, that, that, that's the point David is currently at. He's like, I'm having this conversation in my mind. I'm disheartened. I'm weary. And I feel like, yeah, I'm just going to perish. I'm, my, my life is just going to be, be swept away. There's a lot of pessimistic reasoning here, isn't there? See, pessimistic thinking will always focus on the downside of the future. Even though David knew what the future held, because he'd been promised by God, he had experienced the power and the provision and the promise of God and very real, even though David had experienced and knew the promises and provision of God and what the future would be, that he one day ultimately would be king, all he could do at this point was worry. And that's what happens, right? Right? When we're pessimistic in our reasoning, in our thinking, when we do not trust God for the future, I can assure you, worry will follow. Mind renewal, transformative mind renewal through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the truth of God's word is essential because if all we are doing is listening to our carnal, unspiritual self we stop trusting God for what is next, and we live in a perpetual state of worry, panic, mistrust, and it leads to some very poor decisions. So if I could give you this caution. The way that seems right to me is often rooted in pessimistic reasoning that leads to unnecessary worry and poor decision-making. And then David says at the end of verse 1, and again, we should be going, what? David says in his heart, now I shall be swept away. I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. So, of course, the only 
rational, good decision he can make at this point is, I'm just going to go live with the Philistines. And you're like, what? They are the sworn mortal enemy of Israel. If you recall, many, many weeks ago, we saw Israel and their army come against the Philistines and their army and a young shepherd boy by the name of David, this same David, he killed their champion. And now David's only choice in life, the best decision at this point is, I'm going to go live with them. We're going, what? What, David? You see, God, David feels as though God has deserved it in him. God, God, he's wondering, where, where are you? And, and David's like, I guess I'll just go live then with the enemy. I read a great quote this week by a, a psychologist, and it was kind of a great, great visual picture, but he says this, man is the only created being that runs faster when he has lost his way. I think that's true. It's like we head down a path, we're feeling lost, so what do we do? We just run faster. It's like when you get in a car and you get lost and you don't want to admit you're lost, what do you do? You just drive with more passion and speed that you can muster, figuring it's going to get me there eventually, right? David's weary, he's disheartened, he's full of despair. He's talking to himself. He feels like Saul at some point is going to kill him and he will never be king. And so I might as well go live with our mortal enemy. And he runs fast. But before we're too hard on David, before we're too hard on David, let's think for a moment about how we respond. A story I've always enjoyed reading over the years is Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. It's the story of Christian who wants to leave the city of destruction and move along and move towards the city of God and he, he begins a long pilgrimage, a long journey. But as the story, as this story unfolds, we, we see that the journey is long and the, the journey is hard and it's weighty and there's a point in the story where Christian finds himself falling into what the John Bunyan writes, the, the slough of despond, which is just literally the swamp of despair. And there's not anything necessarily morally or ethically wrong about falling into the swamp of despair, but what we do there is key. But I want you to answer honestly this question for me, and it's this. When you fall into life's swamps of despair, what's your go-to? What, what's your natural response? Oh, sure, maybe there's times in life where you can honestly say, I've just trusted God and he lifted me up and out, and that's fantastic and that's wonderful. But I have a feeling most of us, when we're feeling disheartened, and we're kind of now just listening to ourselves and not listening to the voice of God, I would guarantee that, that most of us have a go-to. And it might not be, I'm going to go live with the enemy like, like David and his swamp of despair, but there's probably some behaviors in your life that define kind of where you go when you find yourself in a swamp of despair. I'll be transparent with you this morning. One of my tendencies is that I can get real frustrated real quickly and I can actually begin to grow quite angry. And actually, most people would never see that because it's really kind of an internal battle. But I can feel frustration and anger welling up inside of me and a lot of times, you know where it comes out? I'm just being totally honest. It comes out when I'm driving the car. And I tell you, some of the things I call people, I don't even know. It's not right. <laughs> but what I've learned over the years is that when I find myself starting to do that, 
I'm becoming more aware and going, all right, something's not right in my heart. Something's not right up here. I'm feeling the pressure of life. I'm feeling a little disheartened. I'm no longer listening to God, and it's starting to come out. It's starting to come out with a little bit of anger, frustration. And the deeper you get into that, the more dangerous it can be. And so I'm honestly asking you today, when you find yourself in the swamp of despair, and you're no longer listening or hearing God, where do you go? What behavior do you run to? What addiction do you run to? That maybe seems right to you at the moment, but as Proverbs says, look again. Look again, for the path leads straight to hell. And so here's another caution. The way that seems right to me is often rooted in despair that moves me away from a loving God and actually towards the enemy. And that was true in David's life. And so hear my pastor's heart today. Hear my pastor's heart today. We got to guard against that. Let me just quickly show you from chapter 27 the consequences. So David is talking to himself. He's no longer listening to God. He feels like he's just about to die. He's in this pit of despair. And the only thing he can come up with is, I'm going to go live with the enemy. I would encourage you to read through chapter 27. But if you look at verses 2 and 3, we see this. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him to the king, and David lived with the Philistine king, Achish, Agath. Isn't it funny? David goes to the very city of where he killed their champion. Verse 3 says that he went with his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives. Let me just tell you this. One of the consequences of poor decision-making is that your actions will never impact just you. I know you think they might, but your actions never impact just you. In this case, it impacted David, his 600 men, and all the families that were with them. If you look at verse 4, and when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, when David had fled to live with the enemy, he no longer sought him. It would be very easy for David at this point to go, oh, obviously I made the right decision. King Saul isn't going to bring the army into the enemy's camp. And so I'll just say this, that sometimes when we make these poor decisions, we feel like our actions have been justified by what seems to be a good result. But in David's case, even though Saul stopped pursuing him and David maybe for the first time felt like he was safe for a while, we will see as the story unpacks in weeks to come that it was really a false sense of security. And so our actions, when we choose to make decisions apart from God, our actions, understand, will only provide you with a short-lived false sense of security or maybe happiness. By the time we come to verse 5, then David says to Achish, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Did you hear that? David, who is to be and has been anointed the king of Israel by Yahweh, creator God. He has been anointed to be the king over his people. And David says at this point in his life, I'm just a servant to the enemy. And understand that when we make poor decisions, we in essence submit our lives to the way of Satan the evil one, we must guard against that. If you look at verses 6 and 7, just look at verse 7 with me. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. This one decision had a 16-month consequence. 
Many of our poor decisions will have lasting consequences. And verses 8 through 12 could be a sermon all by itself, but what we see happening, and if I could just summarize, and I'll, I'll give the PG version here of what's happening in verses 8 through 12, but David basically says to the enemy king, me and my men, we will go out on raids in the surrounding areas, and we will, we will go and we will kill the, 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 your enemy, the people of Israel, to protect you. And the king at this point thinks David has switched sides. David's now on their side. What David actually does, though, is David and his men actually go out and kill not his own people, not, not the people of Israel, but they kill other, other tribal type. And it goes as far to say that David killed absolutely everyone and everything so that nobody could go report to the king, Achish, what he was up to. And so the Philistine king believes that David is on his side getting rid of the, the, the Israelites when in reality David is just off killing other people in very extreme ways and coming back and telling the king that he was killing fellow Israelite. David is living a complete lie at this point. One commentator said it's duplicity. Deception by pretending. And David for 16 months expended every ounce of energy to protect this lie. And I wonder how many of us spend our lives expending all of our energies instead of communing with God. We spend all of our energy trying to protect cloaks of secrecy, covering up our behaviors, making sure we're accountable to no one because we've made poor decisions. You say, well, where does this ultimately end? We'll get to it eventually, but let me just jump a little bit ahead in this story. And read for you 1 Samuel 30, verses 4, 6 through 8. This is where these 16 months eventually lead to. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. This is because of the decision David made back in verse 1. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. This is where ultimately that decision in verse 1 leads to. Now at this point, it might be very easy for us to maybe become a little disheartened. Because we love to look at, if you've been in church for a while, maybe you like to look at David and he's just the, the hero of the story. The, the king who has a heart after God's own heart. The king who, who killed the giant. The king who spared Saul's life. And sometimes we elevate Bible characters to almost a place of, of hero worship. And then you come to a story like this and you're going, what is going on? And here we don't see the hero, David. We see David in the swamp of despair making incredibly poor choices. But I'm going to be honest with you. I read stories like this, and I'm not disappointed with David. I'm thankful these stories are in the Bible. Because if I'm brutally honest, and if you're brutally honest today, we are willing to say, yeah, I've been there. I've been there, been there more than I like to admit. Maybe you're there right now. And you're going, what's the answer? Well, I would do a disservice if I said, well, that's all I've got today. Time to go home. Would never do that because here's the beauty of a loving God. A loving God knew without a doubt that we as his creation, when left to ourselves, would, would, would be stuck in these swamps of despair. We would be stuck in places of horrible decision making. When left to ourselves, the sinful side of us, the carnal side of us, the unspiritual side of us, only leads to paths of destruction if we're brutally honest. 
But God said, I love you enough, and we'll see this true in David's life as well. God says, understand something. David isn't the hero of our stories. God, in the person of Jesus Christ, is the hero of our story. The one true reigning king is the hero of our story today. Because you see, God loved us enough that while we were dead in our sins, while we were dead in these pits of despair, dead in our poor decision making, was rich in love and mercy and sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, who willingly gave his life, willingly paid the penalty for our sin, willingly died upon the cross, and showed that we could have victory over sin, victory over the swamps of despair. By how? By raising up from the dead. By defeating sin and death forever. So that all who would call upon him would have life and a fullness of life and a fullness of joy, a fullness of hope. That we would be gifted the gift of the Holy Spirit. That same power that raised Jesus Christ up from the dead is the same power at work within us that carries us and helps us through life. And so I want to encourage you today, yes, we can be a lot like David. And we must take these cautions seriously. But never lose hope. Even when it seems all is lost as it did in David's life, understand God is at work and he today can be the hero of your story, the true reigning king who can bring you life and a fullness of life if you will just submit to him, call upon him, allow your mind to be renewed by his truth and his spirit. We can live and walk even in the weariness of life. We can walk in freedom and joy and hope because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so the team is going to come, and they, they can come now, and they're going to lead us in a song, and we're going to call out to God together. But would you stand with me? And I just want to read over us some scripture. I just invite you to, to close your eyes and to pray and to hear the voice of God at this point. And just tune out the conversations right now and let the truth of God's word permeate your life today. Paul writes this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are, you are today his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen.